So our guest today is Lila June Johnston. Lila June is an indigenous musician, a scholar, and also a community organizer of Diné, Cheyenne, and European lineages. With her performances, she's engaging audiences across the globe in personal, collective, and ecological healing. She blends her studies in human ecology at Stanford, her graduate work in indigenous pedagogy, and the traditional worldview that she grew up with to inform her music, perspectives, and solutions. She's currently pursuing her PhD, focusing on indigenous food systems revitalizations. So I'm really looking forward to her presentation. And Lila is joining us from a new home in the Gallup area where the reception is, is a bit spotty. So she's joining us by phone and um, I'll be running some slides later. So welcome Leila June. Thank you so much for being here and take it away. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Uh, sorry, you can't see my face. Um, the bandwidth here, I just got a new hotspot yesterday, but apparently it's not great enough to do video. So I'm calling in. I'm so happy to be with you all. So happy to explore this topic of indigenous land management and to some degree indigenous soil management. Uh, I've been kind of uh, an, a novice in this field actually until about four years ago when I really started digging into it. But obviously four years is not very long, especially when many people have been doing this their whole lives and some have been doing it for countless generations and thousands and thousands of years. But I tried to draw from indigenous societies throughout the uh, Turtle Island, as we call it, um, and beyond, uh, regarding the ways in which they took care of the land. And I only chose case studies that were at least a thousand years old. I think the average age of these systems is about 4,000 years old. And it's been the the focus of my dissertation for a long time, uh, just finishing it up right now, I wrote, I wrote the thing and now I just got to upload it to the other thing. Um, but yeah, I have been looking at these different case studies with the intention of trying to unearth some of the lessons they have for us. Um, and also to set the record straight about the sheer sophistication of indigenous cultures and debunk the primitive Indian myth, which has for centuries framed indigenous peoples as simpletons, cavemen, nomads, hunter-gatherers, tribal nomads, um, and uh, not really giving credence to the, the breadth and the depth of these civilizations and how massive they were, how populous they were, how ubiquitous they were throughout Turtle Island. And uh, really, really honoring the, the beauty of these civilizations, which were, you know, not only large, but also very diverse, you know, uh, thousands of them throughout this land. And also not just honoring that, but honoring how how ancient they were long before the Bering Strait. Uh, and and so exciting, you know, in the in the research world, what's going on with um debunking all of these things that we used to take for granted. Uh, for instance, definitely we've debunked the Bering Strait theory unequivocally. We know that native people have been here much, much, much longer than that now. Um, if you, if you just take the footprint that was found in the white sands, that was 23,000 years old. When everyone 40 years ago thought we all came here 16,000 years ago across the Bering Strait, every single Native American here is, was said to have descended from that parent group. Uh, we now know that is unequivocally false. Um, so very exciting, you know, and just planting seeds in people's minds of 
wow, if that's not true, what else isn't true? And not just educating non-Native society, but even educating Native people ourselves. Because growing up, I was even taught the Bering Strait theory as a Native person. I was taught that our civilizations were small and scattered and not very sophisticated. And I believed that most of my life. And it affected my self-esteem as a Native person. And so the implications of these studies are far-reaching for a number of different audiences. And um, I'm just grateful that I found it. I'm grateful I was brought to it. Um, but anyways, um, before I go on, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit um, in my traditional language to honor my ancestors. Um, Greetings, my relatives and my people. My grandma's taught me to see all people as your people, no matter where they're from or what color skin they have. And to fight for all people as our people. Uh, as Diné people, we get our first clan from our mother. In American culture, you get your last name from your father, but in our culture, you get your last name from your mother. Um, so that's my first clan, is the Nanish is Kachitni, um, which is the uh, Black Charcoal Street division of the red running into water people. Um, and that's an ancient clan. And your second clan is your father's mother. You honor your father's mother. So that would be Tsetsestis, or also known as Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne. And then the third clan is your mother's father's clan. So that would be Ashi, Salt clan from the Dene nation. As Dene people, which is my mother's side, we're also incorrectly known as Navajo. Uh, this is not our original self uh, identifier. It was a name kind of put on us by colonial forces. Um, our true name is Dene, which means the people. Uh, we are also known as Nde, Deni, all kinds of uh, Dene people all the way from Alaska down to northern Mexico. We were a very large, very large nation. Um, Auto uh the finale. My last clan is my father's father's clan, the patrilineal, and that would be the European clan. So Akut Ego Dinesh on Isla. In that manner I present myself as a Dene woman. Um I live in this beautiful homeland, Dene Bukea. Um also known as New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Utah area. And um, I share this beautiful homeland with some incredible Pueblo, uh, Nooch, and Autumn relatives, and, and many others. So, getting to the topic, I do have a slideshow, slide deck, whatever it's called. And um, I think I'll go ahead and run it. Um, Forgive me if it's not perfectly on the topic of soil, although I do mention it several times, so hopefully it's helpful. Um, let me pull it up on my end as well. Okay, so Architects of Abundance, Indigenous Food Systems and the Excavation of Hidden History. This photo is a photo of a oyster harvest in the Florida River Banks. It's an artist's rendition of an actual archaeological site where we find these massive mounds of uh, oyster shells. Um, I like this photo because it helps give people a visual of the grandeur of uh, pre-Columbian indigenous food systems. So going to the next slide, uh, the first topic I like to talk about is the chestnut food system of the Shawnee and other Eastern tribes. You'll see this gigantic old growth chestnuts, which are no longer with us, as some of you may know, as they were taken out by a fungus and reduced to almost uh, extinction. Um, 
And the next slide is also the chestnut trees. Um, they like to billow out sometimes. And on the left, you have a Cherokee family next to one of their, what we would call as our relatives. You know, it's not just a tree, it's your relative. And you would treat it as a relative. Just the way you treat your cousin or your uncle or your brother or your um, grandmother. So the next slide is a bit strange, but I'll interpret it. Um, that red line is right around 3,000 years ago. On the, this is a um, showing the fossilized pollen in a soil core taken out of the Kentucky ponds. And on the left hand side is the time. So the higher up in the soil core, the younger the soil, and the deeper you go down into the pond, the older it gets because that sediment was deposited longer ago. So at the very bottom, you could see it's 9,500 years old when the sediment was deposited. And all along the graph, you can see different pollen profiles of different species. So you have spruce, cedar, hemlock, oak, chestnut, hickory. And this is just showing the presence or absence of these types of fossilized pollens throughout time. And what we see around 3,000 years ago is the cedar goes away. The oak makes a rebound. The chestnut comes out of nowhere, as does the hickory nut to some extent. Black walnut comes from absolutely out of nowhere. The pines come back. You have a more diverse forest, you could say, whereas before it was sort of a monocrop of cedar. Um, Going down the line, you have some domesticated sunflower, gooseneck, goose, goosefoot, rather, um, and uh, medicinal plants, plantain docks showing up. On the very right is very important. This is fossilized charcoal coming up. Uh, this fossilized charcoal indicates that they manage this food forest with fire. So this graph is generally interpreted by paleoecologists to, to mean that 3,000 years ago, Shawnee ancestors, um, presumably it's Kentucky, um, moved in and transformed this whole place into a food forest and managed it with routine fire. So we could go back to the last slide with the folks standing by the tree. Um, why would you want to manage a food forest with routine fire? Well, on the left, you could see all this buildup around the tree. You would actually burn that and it would turn into ash, and that would actually feed the soil system. Routine fire also prevents the growth of new saplings that will compete with the old growth trees that you've selected to kind of be the strongest and the biggest. Um, burning the forest floor in between widely spaced old growth trees, which is very common in pre-Columbian uh, America, as we call it. It also brings back the grasses in the spring much more stronger. They're going to be more nutrient dense because they have all that ash, all the phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium uh, built into the soil in a mineralized form from the ash, making it easier for the plants to uptake these minerals and, and embody them. And so you're actually feeding the soil whenever you burn around these, uh, these groves. And that attracts deer and buffalo and elk and what have you, herbivores. So you kind of create a system where it's widely spaced food trees, a meadow of grass in between, and herbivores who obviously could be hunted for um, protein needs. So it's a very dynamic food system, and I'm definitely oversimplifying it, but hopefully it gives you a, a picture of how sophisticated these food systems were. Um, moving on to the Baure floodplain aquaculture slide. This is uh, in Bolivia, where folks would actually funnel the floodplain, rather the, the flood, um, during the rainy season. They would funnel them into pools 
they would catch the receding rainwaters with these gigantic earthen berms, earthen walls that they would create. They created canals that would have water in them year round, whether it was the rainy season or not. You go to the next slide. You could see they basically worked with the water to create ring ditches, to create raised fields, to create little reservoirs, to create uh, settlement mounds, forest islands, uh, fish weirs, such that every time the water would recede, you, the whole system would catch the fish on the way out. And you'd have a year round supply of fish in these reservoirs that you had created. The next slide has an aerial view of these massive earthworks, um, just to give you a, an idea of how massive these things were, funneling water into certain reservoirs. Um, what's interesting too about this is, if you go back two slides, you'll see some of these, this is an artist's rendition, of course, um, but we find remnants of these fruit trees planted along the earthen berms. So similar to the Shawnee chestnut forest, it's a multi-purpose food system. It's designed to capture fish. It's designed to um, proliferate fruit trees on the earthen berms themselves. Um, and these fruit trees are said to have attracted game animals as well. So you have your protein coming in. And a ton of snails, apparently, a lot of escargot ready to go. So it's a multi-purpose biodiverse food system operating on a landscape scale. So if we go on to the aerial view and one more slide past the aerial view, this shows the sheer scale of the area that was managed. This whole area with the black dotted lines was uh, manage this way. So it's a massive human endeavor, which is how we know that these were not little tiny tribes running around. These were massively populated civilizations because only that amount of people could move that amount of dirt and create this uh, size of a uh, floodplain aquaculture system. Um, moving on more to closer to where we are, uh, looking at the uh, Shiwi, or also known incorrectly as Zuni, uh, runoff agriculture. <clears throat> Many of you may know about this alluvial farming technique. But you place your fields at the base of small watersheds, as we see on the left. And the water would run through, and you slow it down with a, a temporary dam that could be adjusted or bolstered or thinned out, depending on, you know, Depending on what comes, depending on how big of a dam you need and how much water you need to slow down. Anyways, you would plant your fields um, at the base of these watersheds because it's not only bringing in water from the monsoon rains, it's also bringing in nutrients from the upland hills. So these systems uh, did not require a whole lot of outside fertilizer. Um, the soil coming down from the mountains was full of fertilizer, <clears throat> was, is, I should say, it's still, still practiced today. On the right, you see these crops being grown um, at the base of these hills. If you go to the next slide, you just see the, the alluvial fan, you know, and you would kind of honor the fan and you would dovetail with what it's doing already. You wouldn't try to pipe water out or irrigate water out or haul in fertilizers. You just go where those things are already flowing already, which not only honors Mother Earth and honors what she's doing and kind of goes behind her, it's also just more efficient because it's less fossil fuels used to haul in fertilizers, less uh, piping, irrigating, um, it's, it's quite efficient. Uh, a, a lot of these systems, if you notice, they let Mother Earth do a lot of the kinetic work for them. The floodplains, for example, they let the floods, all that massive kinetic energy of the floods, and then they just kind of dovetail that and harness that instead of trying to create 
reservoirs and dams and pipey stuff all over the place and trying to master and control the earth instead to go where the earth is already doing its thing. So uh, moving along, we're going to the Gunditjmara eel farms, which are in um, Australia. And this little wall here with the water in the middle of it uh, on the upper left is a um, 6,000 year old basalt um, aquaculture system created by the Gunditjmara nation who have been there at least 6,000 years. And so what this is, is this is an eel farm. So you basically, you have eels, which are a catadromous species, which means they are both salt and freshwater. So they'll swim all the way down the river to the ocean and then they'll spawn and then they'll come all the way up the river to come and hang out and mature into full grown eels, the opposite of salmon. Um, and then they will, along the way, this system kind of would catch them. It would funnel them around. It would catch them into reservoirs. But mind you, it was not an extractive process because otherwise it wouldn't have lasted 6,000 years a 6,000 year old system that went on and on and on and on because the Gunditjmara see the eels as their relatives who are equal in every way to human beings. And so just as the eels fed Gunditjmara people for 6,000 years, so too would the Gunditjmara take care of the eels and make sure they were happy, healthy, uh, make sure they had everything that they needed, make sure they had a home to come back to, not over harvest them let them have their families, et cetera. Uh, this was drained to make way for a cattle farm in, I want to say the 60s. Um, and only recently was it restored and they brought the whole system back to life. It is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, here are the next slide. The American grasslands pyro management is important. On the left, you see folks burning in between those old growths, like I said. Uh, here's a quote from one of the uh, historical ecologists uh, that I cite. Um, the Illinois Confederacy shaped and altered much of this region as an anthropogenic creation. Like many other indigenous groups in North America, their most important tool was fire. Burning the prairies, they made the grasses hospitable for grazers and managed prairie as a game reserve to maximize productivity. So the formula here is you add fire, creates ash, opens pyro-adapted seed pods, uh, you burn in the, in the fall, and then in the spring, you have these nutrient-dense grasses, which attract the game, which you hunt and you eat. Um, respectfully, of course, you also are eliminating the takeover of shrubs and saplings that otherwise would take over the whole grasslands and turn it into a small or large forest. So you're opening up the canopy, you're spacing out the trees, which the trees like that because then they don't have to compete with each other for limited nutrients, sunlight, and water. And you're creating an opened up system that um, is a really biodiverse food system. Uh, so much so that all of these species became pyro-adapted, meaning they needed fire in order to blossom. So going to the next slide, burning was so important, is so important to Native nations that even our lunar calendar reflected this important um, behavior. The grass-burning moon is similar to our September in the Miamia lunar calendar. The Miamia Nation is indigenous to what we now call the Ohio River Valley. And burning was so important to them and all the tribes in that area that almost all of them have this grass burning moon, which uh, reminds them what time it is to, to go out and, and burn. So moving on, uh, there's a quote from the Miamia researchers. They say in Sasha Kali. Kayolias Kilswa, which means the grass burning moon, we see fire as something that restores and gives new life to the prairie. Fire helps clear the land of old grass and brush and open seed pods that have fallen to the ground. Because of fire, new flowers and plants emerge in the spring. For example, Echinacea is actually a pyro-adapted species. They flourish 
after fire. Um, moving to the next slide. This is a great book I'd highly recommend if you're into soil management, um, Forgotten Fires. Um, it goes, you know, state by state, region by region, all these firsthand accounts of how Native people would burn in the area. On the right hand side, you see a buffalo pasture, which if you go to the same area in Texas today, it's actually um, a thicket, a thicket of bushes. So that grasslands and the buffalo depend on the fire. Um, I think this is second to last, yes, or third to last, fourth to last. <laughs> I'll try to hurry. So the next is the cane systems of the American South. Um, cane is another word for bamboo. If you go to the next slide, you can see how cane was so important to the indigenous nations of what we now call the South, the Muscogee, the Chata, Chickasaw, uh, Tsalagi, different native nations all around that area uh, were really uh, dependent on bamboo for everything they used. Unfortunately, this bamboo species has been reduced to about 98% of its original habitat, mostly replaced by cotton fields. And um, this was managed, if you go to the next slide, by fire as well. You burn the cane which creates more cane. Cane bounces back after disturbance. So anytime you hurt cane, you actually help cane. If you knock it down with wind or flood or fire, it actually opens up more sunlight, which allows new culms to sprout. And if you don't burn it, if you don't disturb it, it actually collapses in on itself. So it actually needs disturbance in order to perpetuate itself. So fire would burn, uh, help, the, help clear out the cane. It would grow back stronger, faster. On the left-hand side is the buffalo belt. So you have actually, people don't realize this, but buffalo were all over this country. Uh, as far as east is Pennsylvania, far south is Georgia. And buffalo is an important part of the southern tribe's um, life, life way. So the buffalo and the cane and the human fire had this uh, cyclic relationship where the buffalo would feed the people, the people would feed the cane by feeding it fire, and the, and the cane would feed the buffalo, because it's not just pandas who like bamboo. Buffalo did too. Going on to the next slide, we have um, an ancient oyster farm. This is a, I think it was, oh, I think it's 1,500 years worth of oyster harvesting were um, discovered, you could say, by looking at the radiocarbon dating, the oyster shells that we find in the Chesapeake Bay area. So right where Washington, D.C. is, and indigenous peoples were sustainably harvesting oysters out of the bay for thousands of years. And um, the Smithsonian says ancient Native American methods may be key to sustainable oyster harvest. And we say, yeah, we've been saying that all along, but now that the Smithsonian says it, it's correct. <laughs> um, very exciting stuff. I could go on and on about oysters, but I'll go to the next slide. Um, so this is a herring, which is a little silver fish. It lays its eggs on everything in the water. So the health hook indigenous nation here in near Vancouver, um, they actually create this whole system where they plant kelp forests and they plant um, hemlock boughs into the ocean. And the kelp forests are self-growing, whereas the hemlock boughs are kind of chopped off and dead and just in the water. But they actually grow kelp to create more surface area for the herring to lay their eggs. If you go to the next slide, you'll see on the left the herring are spawning, laying eggs everywhere. In the middle, you see uh, herring on hemlock, which is a delicacy in that area. It's yummy, you know, fish eggs. It's super expensive in the global market, actually. Um, what do you call it? Caviar. Uh, on the right, you see herring on hemlock with the help hook guy holding up his harvest. Um, next slide, you see the actual creation of these kelp forests. Uh, these are gi giant kelp. They grow very fast. So 
the really important thing is that these people don't just grow kelp for themselves. They grow it so that more herring eggs can be laid for everyone, for the bears, for the orcas, for the salmon, up the food chain to the eagles, to the wolves. Everybody eats these eggs. And they also plant enough of this to support the herring themselves who need to have enough eggs hatched so that some can come back next year. So the important takeaway for this case study is that these people are feeding a system outside of themselves. It's not a farm where it's just me, 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 maybe I need to make more money, like help the humans. It's actually humans being in service to the larger system. So the last case study here is the Amazonian dark earth, which you may have heard of. Um, on the left, you see this loamy topsoil, maybe foot and a half, two feet, can't really tell, quite a few feet deep. Um, this is an ancient soil system. On the right-hand side, all these dark black dots are where they found massive uh, dark earth patches, which are connected to where the settlements were. And in the middle, you see someone with the dark earth. And this is a gigantic composting operation whereby they um, input a lot of everything, ash, residue from previous year's crops. Um, they put in termite piles uh, or old termite piles. Um, they put all kinds of amendments into the soil. They also put a lot of their broken ceramics into the soil, which frankly, I don't understand why I, I should, but I haven't researched that. But something about their broken ceramics in the soil helps. Maybe someone on the call knows. <laughs> but um, it's an ancient soil system. And I didn't know this, but Amazonian soils are some of the most nutrient poor in the world. And a lot of the Amazonian rainforest, as we know it, is not actually just a natural phenomenon. It's actually human assisted. If it wasn't for this large scale, regional scale creation of soil systems, a lot of these plants uh, would not have a place to take root. So by and large, the Amazonian rainforest was very much a human creation um, or co-creation, you could say. So the next slide is, you know, main takeaways are like habitat expansion, like we see with um, the chestnuts or the grasslands. You know, you're expanding buffalo habitat by expanding the grasslands, by burning. And by burning, you create wider and bigger you know, grasslands for the buffalo to be in. So a lot of people think we hunted the buffalo when in fact, or rather we followed the buffalo when in fact the buffalo arguably followed our fire. So it's not like we were just running around hunting buffalo where we could find them. We actually created a home for them and, um, and hunted them in these, in the grassland habitats that we created. So it's very fascinating. Uh, it's like a fenceless ranch, you know, you just create a home and people come to you. <laughs> um, reciprocity, you know, being in reciprocity with the beings that are giving their life for you to have life. Um, these ranches and farms are very much a one way street. Oftentimes they're very much extractive, as we all know, and they are about feeding humans. But what if our systems were equally about feeding the ecosystem which humans are a part of, uh, more so than just being human-centric or anthropocentric. Next is holistic management, you know, looking on a regional scale. These were not little oyster farms, you know, these guys were managing entire estuaries. They were landscape scale projects. They were millennial scale, meaning they're thousands of years old. They're consent or free will based. Nothing in here was caged. Nothing in here was pinned up. Everything here, I'm not saying we didn't do that at all, because sometimes we did, but everything here, except for maybe the eels, although they did come and go as they pleased as well, were free to come and go. Um, so there was some consent built into it. Uh, stewardship mentality. So the next um, slide is some recommendations that I think we should collapse our parcels into larger regional food shed cooperatives. I think fencing stuff off into little squares is never going to tap into the larger regional forces that are at play. And until we defense the world, we're never going to have holistic management. Um, 
DNA ancestral diet based, you know, eat what your ancestors ate. Um, not all people digest the same thing the same. Not all people can metabolize the same thing. So being sensitive to your ancestral diet. Um, pilot projects, you know, um, basically, you know, a lot of the world doesn't trust us yet with these things. So we got to start small and show them proof of concept, um, which a lot of people are doing. Local and indigenous species. You know, um, to not import exotic species, or if you do, to do so very consciously and cautiously, to honor what the ecosystem already had, because it's part of a larger web that needs to be reintroduced for the web to be whole. Um, land back, you know, I don't think it's enough to just take everything I'm saying today and apply it to your farm. I think we must also work to restore ownership of lands to indigenous peoples who've been dispossessed of their lands. For example, all of the tribes in Oklahoma, almost all of them are not from there. They're only there because their original homeland was taken away from them brutally. And so for every acre that we apply indigenous knowledge to, we should also fight to get another acre back to indigenous peoples themselves. Otherwise, I feel like we're just appropriating knowledge without giving back to the communities that, that gave us this knowledge. So very important land back, you know, being reciprocal with Native people who have this knowledge and not just feeling, oh, this is a great idea. I'm going to take it and run with it. But remember where it came from and remember that these people are often still living like refugees in their own homeland because they've been dispossessed and displaced and relocated. There's still a wound that has not been addressed in this country. Um, next slide. This is my attempt to reframe this continent from America to Turtle Island, as we call it, which comes from a Haudenosaunee creation story of this turtle who became a landmass. And changing the narrative to a densely populated, extensively managed continent before Columbus, instead of what we're taught in schools, which was a sparsely populated place that was basically in a state of nature untouched by humans. Um, changing that narrative to a densely populated, extensively human-managed continent. Continents all around the world has happened, actually. So I will stop there and open it up for questions. And I thank you all for taking the time to, to uh, let me share some of, my, some of the thoughts that the elders have helped me understand. Thank you, Lila, so much for that Indigenous knowledge. It's so moving and inspiring and compelling. I wanted to make sure everyone has a chance to ask questions uh, with Lila. So if you have a question, just indicate that in the chat and then you can unmute and ask in your own voice or comment in your own voice. So just to get started, maybe Linda Poole could uh, unmute and and share her comment regarding the pot shards. Uh, first, I would like to thank Lila June. That was an amazing presentation. And I learned so much. I always love to interconnect what I, I've learned in lots of different ways. And one is that I, I do bonsai culture. Um, because I live in a little house and I love lots of plants. <laughs> and we often use small clay pellets in our soil as part of a, a soil amendment. And when I was taught this practice, it was said that it was for soil moisture management and for air exchange. I've always wondered too, if maybe minerals were part of it because the clay, um, uh, the minerals in there. So it, it really wasn't a question. I was just trying to connect the pot shards in the dark earth, which uh, I just think that that is such a phenomenal way for us to recast our ideas of food waste and uh, clothing waste as well, different things, you know, so Maybe, maybe also broken pieces of pottery, even today, could be part of what we're doing with our composting. So anyway, thank you again for a wonderful presentation. 
soil moisture management and aeration. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yep. Um, the the pellets that they put in um, are about well, at least the ones I use. They're about a half inch around, and um, they're porous. And so uh, the idea just being that rather than putting in hard rocks, evidently this is it's part of age old way of dealing with um, trying to have plants that live for hundreds of years very much contained in a in a pot. Um, so I, I have no idea if it interrelates. Uh, I think it definitely does. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't um, because they are clay ceramics. So that um, sounds right and probably more than that too. Who knows? But thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Linda. And um, Charlie Painter has a question about the cycle of tree growth and a comment about the Hermit's Peak fire. Yeah, um, ditto on the wonderful presentation, Lila, just all around uh, information and just how we should start thinking about things and the Native American people in this country. I did, your, your chart was really interesting and there's talk in this area. I, I managed my family ranch in the Guyanus Canyon above Las Vegas. And there's talk in the Southwest about how we may lose some of our conifer trees due to drought and just general cycle. And I'm wondering what you might think of that. And then my comment about the Hermit's Peak fire is just that a, a lot of what you're saying is really relevant to the regeneration of what we're trying to accomplish here on our ranch and in the canyon and just the information about fires because it's really interesting to see how the fire that just went through the ground and didn't burn down trees really helped regenerate everything and then of course we have tree stands that got severely burned but just that for 100 years we haven't done any of that and we're seeing the consequences of that so that was my only comment, um, but yes, if you could uh, give your comments about the cycle of pine trees in this area, and if you think we're gonna lose some or what might happen. Oh, and one more thing, sorry. I wanna thank Isabel and Rob for putting on these. Uh, I would have never, if I hadn't gone to some of the workshops this summer that they put on, after the fire and these type of things really got interested in this and it's also wonderfully relevant. So thank you guys too. Yeah, um, anyone who's in my field really, really knows that the Smokey the Bear policy has been incredibly detrimental to American forests or rather Turtle Island forests. Um, um, my theory, although I haven't really tested it, is that the conifer die-off is in large part due to the prohibition of indigenous fire. Uh, throughout the Southwest, Native peoples burned this whole place routinely. Um, we managed these uh, mountain ranges, the Jemez folks, we have a lot of research done on pre-Columbian, pre-Hispanic Jemez uh, forest management with routine fire. Um, but, the, but the goal always is to space the trees and thin the forest, um, which is the opposite goal of the U.S. Forest Service, <laughs> which is to never burn anything, let the forest fill up. And I don't know why they don't understand why that's a bad idea, but so, so here's you hear this when you have a huge thicket of pine trees there's a number of issues going on number one it becomes a monoculture of pine the pine takes over in successional growth the pine takes over number two even if you wanted pine the pine are growing straight up they're not allowed to billow out because they're competing for the canopy so you have a whole bunch of tall skinny trees which we've all seen in the forest around here right whole bunch of tall skinny trees um, and they're all super packed close together 
competing with each other, choking each other out, um, much like the bamboo uh, choking itself out. Um, another thing you have is in addition to a scarcity of sunlight, because the canopy is just everyone's fighting for it because it's so thick and, and close together. You also have a scarcity of minerals in the soil, right? Nutrients, because all of these trees are sucking them out and competing for limited nutrients. So that, what, what does that create? That creates a thick forest. Uh, they, they need their nutrients and vitamins just like we do to have a healthy immune system. Trees have immune systems. Uh, they're more susceptible to bugs, viruses, fungi, all, not viruses, but rather fungi, blight, um, insects, etc. You also have a scarcity of water because all these root systems are pulling up every drop they can get. Then you add to that climate crisis with the drought. So what you have is a whole bunch of tall, thick, skinny, dry trees, <laughs> which is basically a tinderbox waiting to go up in flames. And I frankly, I don't understand why everyone's so surprised when these things go up in flames because it's designed to be flammable. Well, uh, I, I, maybe I not intentionally. I, I think that's the long-term lesson everybody's learning, we hope. And nobody up here is anti-burn they just sort of started the fire at the wrong time, but we all kind of knew that this was bound to happen sooner or later, but that's really interesting uh, answer. And like now we have a chance in some of our areas to regenerate correctly. So that's our goal. So uh, again, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Well, and again, I can't stress enough too how important it is to consider how we got this land, right? Because there were indigenous peoples here. And in addition to, yes, we want to regenerate it, but if we regenerate it, we might heal the soil and the trees, but we won't heal the past. We need to also, uh, as much as we work to regenerate these lands, like I said, every, every acre we regenerate for our own ranches, our own farms, we should give another acre back to indigenous peoples who've been dispossessed, if we can. So that I would really... Uh, challenge all of us on this call to think about how do we get this ranch? What processes of colonization led to us having this gigantic asset and the reservations being so small? Um, and so I think um, that's another side note to consider. Um, but so on the flip side, if you space the trees out, they're allowed to billow out, right? They're allowed to have uh, plenty of water and nutrients. And so um, my last thing I'll say about that is that I, I think it's unfortunate that a lot of the blame for these forest fires is being put on the climate crisis because it eclipses the fact that we've been prohibiting indigenous fire for hundreds, 150, 200 years. It's a really fascinating research on um, the um, uh, Apache, you know, the Nde fires in the Gila forests, other areas in Arizona, which um, the uh, Apache folks were constantly demonized for burning the forest and they were chastised and they were spit on. And it was just uh, so exciting to see how we can not only bring fire back, but bring the fire keepers back, you know, the uh, indigenous folks back so that they can be whole, you know, we're all connected. And when we are taken away, when the fire and the people are taken away from the forest, the forest is also being taken away from the people. And so each are equally affected. And, and until we come back together, we're not going to be 100% whole, I, I think. Um, so um, that's not to say Indigenous people should have everything. I think it's about sharing and it's about coexisting and uh, healing certain injustices in the past. Um, okay, I think we have time for what? One more question? Two more, maybe? We have time for a couple more. Um, thank you for this discussion. Adrian, if she would like to unmute just to make her comment. And her comment, just she may not be on right now or 
unable to hear me, but she said, thank you so much, Lila. This was fantastic. And uh, Priscilla, Priscilla Martinez has a question. If you want to unmute, please. Uh, Akiha, for all the information that you shared with us, um, and, oh. and um, I just wanted to make a comment, um, a quick comment. Um, I teach, and I think it's um, what, what I'm seeing in the classrooms is that a lot of our students have lost their connection to the land. Um, I did my independent study um, for my master's and found that many of our students, not only have they lost that connection, but they're losing the culture and the stories because um, they have forgotten how some of them to plant and how to um, you know, tie that in with the culture, with the stories that are told, you know, depending on what time of the year and what have you. And it's um, right now, I think it's really fundamental and important to bring that back into the classroom to um, not only teach our, our students about the culture and what their ancestors ate and how they planted, but to also bring their grandparents in, the storytellers to teach the kids about you know, how this was done. I remember that my father-in-law was a medicine man and a Navajo co-talker and he always planted. So our kids were raised learning the stories and how to plant, but more and more we're getting further away from that. And so, um, you know, I just kind of wanted to make a comment on that, but thank you for all the, you know, all the positive information. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Lila, we have, um, I guess it's 625. Isabel has a, a closing uh, comments about upcoming events, but um, we all really so from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for your wisdom and caring and love that you're sharing here with us. And um, wanted to see if you wanted to have a uh, closing comment of any kind. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for organizing this and also thank you to each and every one of the participants. And I know that each and every one of you could probably be giving this talk and I wish I could sit and listen to you. So I feel honored that I was the person to speak. Um, I'm very grateful for all the work that you do and all the ways that you're connected to the earth. Um, and thank you for everything that you do. And um, yes, uh, we'll be in touch and just, have a beautiful, beautiful new year.